Welcome to Insight, today produced in partnership with KCOS 13 El Paso Public Television. Today we're chatting with a group of chief executives from various parts of the El Paso cultural landscape. Tracy Jerome is director of the Museum and Cultural Affairs Office of the City of El Paso. Uh, Paul Kortnar is the founding director of the El Paso Children's Museum. Lloyd Shepard is the executive director of the El Paso Holocaust Museum. And Victoria Ramirez is director of the El Paso Museum of Art. They have generously agreed to share some of their experience with us. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. So art, culture, <laughs> history, this is such an important topic for any community. Tracy, from your perspective, talk about the importance of culture, of educational services to the city of El Paso. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's a great time right now to be in El Paso. Um, the city is, is really going through a, a true renaissance in every aspect um, of what's happening here. And the arts and cultural scene is truly at the, at the center of all of that. Um, we are partners at the table for the economic development and the sustainability that we're striving and thriving for for the community. Um, you know, when we're looking at bringing businesses in, when we're looking at bringing investment into this community, which has a very long and deep uh, and beautiful cultural and historical background, um, the new you know newcomers to El Paso, which I am I am one, um, want to know about that and they want to know what they can experience when they're here. Um, so it's not just about, you know, coming to a, a community and being able to sort of plop down and make business happen and, and, you know, the roads are important and schools are important and hospitals are important, but people really want to know what their quality of life and what their quality of experience is going to be. And so this community is working very hard um, and we're pulling together in, in, in an incredible way to make sure that the facilities that we have and the institutions that are in place um, remain sustainable and continue to grow and that we continue to grow the family as it were. Um, we have, you know, an amazing museum of art. We have a, a great museum of history, a museum of archaeology, our Holocaust museum. Um, we're bringing on board a new children's museum. We're going to be bringing on board um, a cultural center. Um, and these are just the beginnings of what I think is going to turn into this, again, this incredible community that if you haven't come to see us yet, you have to, and you will fall in love when you get here. And it's so important for not only civil society, but also, mm -hmm. as you say, for the business environment here, if you're going to site a business, if you're going to make the decision to site your facility in El Paso, you're going to have to hire employees. And those mm -hmm. employees, you want them to stay. You want them to enjoy the life of, of the community. You want to have them exposed to art and, and different activities. Mm -hmm. Talk about how the art museum is, is looking at your audience here uh, on the border uh, with Mexico and how you serve your very diverse communities here in El Paso, Victoria. Sure. So the El Paso Museum of Art, when we talk about our audience, we really, uh, we look at the borderplex. And uh, someone, when I arrived in El Paso, they described the borderplex as uh, three cities, El Paso, Las Cruces, and Juarez, two countries, U.S., Mexico, um, and three states. Uh, Texas, Chihuahua, Mexico, and uh, New Mexico. And two languages. And two languages. And um, for me, that was so intriguing. And I, I think that, uh, you know, if, if on the surface you look at the El Paso Museum of Art and think that we're just serving El Paso proper, we're really not. We, we look beyond that. And um, you mentioned the, the idea of, of quality of life and, and how cultural institutions can be such an asset for a community. And um, I think one of the things I'm most proud of with the Art Museum is our collection and the quality of our exhibitions and programming. Um, I've been in El Paso about 10 months now, and when people see the quality of what we're offering, uh, the works that are in our permanent collection, they realize this is a world-class art museum that's in El Paso, Texas. And to move their family here doesn't mean that they're, um, uh, you know, sacrificing a cultural experience. Their children can have those experiences. They can continue to have them. And um, I, I'm really proud to be part of the art museum, but also proud of the museum community. 
I think there are very few communities, especially the size of, of our region, that have the number and the range of types of museums that we have. And speaking of children, children also require other forms of, of entertainment and experiences. One of the things that I find so impressive about El Paso is El Paso recognizing this is now investing in a new uh, children's mm -hmm. museum. Paul, how, uh, talk about the, the project to build this museum and what attracted you to, to this place at this time to, to drive this project forward to fruition. Well, um, I'm also new to El Paso, and uh, I, uh, I was very excited to come precisely because there was a commitment on the part of the city to see this museum uh, come to fruition. Uh, it's, it was part of a quality of life bond that there would be a children's museum so here. So the community is investing in this institution. That's a very, very important point. That's right. And, and for me, the, the interesting thing about children's museums generally, and specifically one here, is the way that they fit in, as all the museums do here, uh, as part of the educational infrastructure of the community. You know, um, uh, across the country, uh, children growing up in cities have access to educational experiences beyond the classroom. And we need to, and we do provide those experiences in the different museums that exist here in the community. And the Children's Museum will be an integral part of that, allowing kids to develop skills that they otherwise might not have a chance to experience in the regular classroom. So all of our museums provide ex educational experiences for children that, that go beyond uh, what can happen in school. And that's incredibly important in every, in every community. And I think one of the challenges and one of the things I'm most looking forward to here is the idea of uh, access and accessibility and determining what it is that um, uh, gets people thinking of attending the local museum, whichever museum, mm. uh, you know, that's something I want to do with my family or if it's something that doesn't even cross your mind. And how do we... How do we make the museum experience part of what everybody's thinking about as they try to determine the, uh, the, the engaging things they'd like to do with their family each weekend, et cetera? You know, um, in some communities, uh, visiting the museum is something you only do as a tourist, if you think of going to the Met in New York or something like that. And our museums are embedded and integrated within the community. And, and, and it's interesting to, to look at that challenge of how do you improve accessibility for everybody in the community. The other thing that I find so interesting about the arc, uh, the arc of, of museums here is that you have museums that deal with STEM and, and STEAM aspects for children uh, to, to learn how the physical world works. You have museums of archaeology. You have museums of art. You also have a, a, a Holocaust museum that has... A, a tremendous exhibition program, and you expose people to the realities of this world that, that we mm -hmm. see, whether it is the um, uh, unfolding in, in Miramar of uh, ethnic cleansing or in Africa or in uh, places in Syria where you have uh, different um, uh, sects warring against each other. Lori, talk about the Holocaust Museum in El Paso. Well. The roots of the Holocaust Museum in El Paso are not what one would expect. Um, in fact, most people come through the front door and say, why is this here? We in El Paso have a huge uh, population of survivors who immigrated to El Paso, Texas after the Holocaust. Um, at one point, we had almost 90 survivors living here in El Paso. One of the other aspects is that we have a wonderful um, military community in Fort Bliss. And a tremendous number of those liberators, those men who right. liberated those camps, came back and because El Paso is so wonderful, made it their home. So we have both of those um, aspects to draw from as we, this is our 34th year of our, of our museum's existence. What the Holocaust Museum does culturally and educationally is it gives students an opportunity to see the importance of um, overcoming intolerance and bigotry. And just as Victoria was speaking a moment ago about the fact that we're not just El Paso, we have a unique challenge, but also a unique opportunity to reach out to people who didn't necessarily learn the history of the Holocaust as they learned the history of World War II in their, in their 11th grade history studies that come over from um, Mexico 
And we also have the folks who are here and are learning it through Texas and New Mexico school systems. So we have this wonderful um, opportunity to come at that history and also that cultural understanding from two different directions. And it, it really broadens things for us and gives us a chance to see it from both sides. How do you manage this as individuals and as members of an ecosystem? How do you uh, collaborate? How do you orchestrate a, a museum e ecosystem that is complementary and is not at odds with one another, because one of the ways you could look at this, but this is not the El Paso way, is, is as if you're all competing for, for audience. And you could end up expending a lot of energy in that competition, but, but you don't do that mm -hmm. here in El Paso. I, I think we have a, a very unique, um, the geography is very unique, and you can either look at us as this uh, place at the end of the earth, you know, because we're in far west Texas. We're the only city in all of Texas in the mountain time zone. So we're like not even on the same time with everybody else. <laughs> so we're a little different. Um, I see us as an oasis. And we support each other. We work together. And uh, I think there's a natural affinity when you are on the frontier to a degree and you're still doing things kind of on your own and you, you can't just go next door to the next door neighbor. Um, we work together and I'm very proud of the fact that through our department, we fund everyone sitting at this table um, through a granting program that we're very committed to. We fund over 70 individuals and organizations on an annual basis. And that's really important to us, for example, from a departmental standpoint and from you know, making sure that there's money enough for everybody to do you know, something. Um, but from a programming perspective, you know, you have brought in, for example, not only collaborations with other museums, but other cultural organizations. Mm -hmm. For example, the, you know, the symphony comes and performs mm -hmm. and the ballet has performed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can get on the list of variety of performing artists as well as visual artists who have been at the museum. You do the same. And I know that the Children's Museum will tap into all of that incredible creativity on all these opportunities that we have in this community. So. I mean, I don't think anyone feels in competition with each other. I think that we, we really do have a unique um, attitude here in so much as we are stronger when we're together. And, and the community benefits from that greatly because there, are no, there aren't these dividing lines or these silos. Um, now, it gets busy. It gets really busy sometimes because there are times when there's a lot of things going on at the same time, but that's, that's where we want to be. Yeah. I, I think, though, that you know, all museums face the t same challenge. And that is getting the people who don't think that museums are for them to think about us, to have, to have the museum on, on their radar, to think about us on a Saturday afternoon as, as something that would be fun and enriching to do. And, and we all have our core audiences, and, and those will come to our door, through our doors, and they'll come to our events. But it's changing people's attitudes and... and um, and their perceptions about what museums are. And the best way that museums can do that is collaboratively. And I think if we all had this commitment that as a museum community, we are gonna make ourselves more welcoming, um, it, it would automatically raise uh, the profile of, of the museum community and increase our audiences. And Paul, you said something about that earlier, that, that idea that we just want to be a consideration. Well, There's the movies, the mall, and the museum, you know? <laughs> well, I, I think one of the challenges is always that there's, um, I, I, I think of this as a failure of imagination. People don't know, people don't imagine themselves in mm -hmm. the museum. And so they don't know what happens inside, what, what the, for lack of a better term, what the value add proposition is. You know, they're willing to join the, the YMCA as members or the YWCA because they know what happens and what goes on inside and what, and what they get for their membership. But when they, they don't know to, that joining one of our museums provides opportunities for education and for growth mm -hmm. and for cultural experience. And, and if they don't know what those uh, opportunities are, then they don't take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. And so we have to work together Mm -hmm. to, to help people to understand uh, why using our, our institutions is a, is, a, is a true value add for their families and for the whole community. Talk about your, uh, your school programs and how you uh, help uh, school children to experience the museums and then 
Uh, maybe the children can also be encouraged to bring their parents in and then their families in, and then mm -hmm. you start having transgener transgenerational involvement, and all of a sudden your audience grows. Talk about your, your, your particularly for, for the two non-children's museums, <laughs> uh, how that functions. Well, coming from an art museum, I think it's especially important that we reach out to, to children. And um, in many ways, we define children in, in two ways. There are children who, who come in as students, and they come in with their school and with their classes. And then, of course, the children who come in with their families. Um, and we want them all. We want them all here. Uh, in El Paso, we're really fortunate. We have a, a great partnership with the El Paso Independent School District, and we see every fourth grader and uh, the, comes to the museum on a field trip. And it gives us a great opportunity to, um, to reach all parts of the community uh, and even to reach out to the, to the schools and the teachers who may not necessarily have a real affinity for, for art, for example, or see how art can support their curriculum. Um, and so it's in some ways can be a really exciting way to introduce the art museum to, to these young kids and then the teachers and their parents. Um, one thing I'm really proud of about the El Paso Museum of Art is that we're free. And so we do offer a range of programs for children and for families. Uh, we have an art school with beautiful studio spaces that offer art making classes. Um, but in many ways, the, the approach that we take to working with children is the same as with adults in that it's interdisciplinary. There's so many different ways to approach a work of art. You can look at it, you can make it, you can listen to music that relates to it, you can write about it, you can talk about it. And we want to introduce art to children in that way. Um, it, it's always funny to me because um, working with schools you know, schools are really the only place where subject matter is confined to a classroom. Social studies never connects to art, which never connects to science. But in art and at museums, they all sort of blend together. And to me, there are so many exciting moments when working with children because they start to see that there's George Washington on the wall at the El Paso Museum of Art. And we're talking about science and we're talking about music and all of that can happen just from a work of art. And Lori, how, how do you interact with children in the school system? Well, I, I, I love what you were saying about all of the different interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. For us, we use art as a different narrative mm. to tell the story of the Holocaust. But one of the things you asked a moment ago was how does that relate to bringing kids in? So about a third of our visitors are school, uh, our school children, middle school and high school children who are coming with a class. And we love that. And it, as they leave, we give them a family invitation, a physical family invitation to bring their family back. Because what we find is the students come with the schools but the parents don't necessarily have the draw. So we wanna make sure that they're, they are coming back and they will. And so they'll come on Thursday with their student, with their class as students, and they'll come back on Sunday afternoon with their parents and their grandparents and their cousins. And, and they get to be the museum tour guide. They do and they love it. And what they've done is gone home and say to their parents, this was fantastic. So parents who maybe don't, haven't yet had an opportunity to see the value of a museum actually learn from their children. The students become the teachers. Mm -hmm. And they bring their parents back, they bring their families back. And that's such a wonderful opportunity to see somebody in their 40s who really that might be their first visit to a museum. Mm -hmm. And it's such a fantastic opportunity to then get them down into that, to the museum community downtown and say, but we're not the only one. There's so many op options, so many opportunities. And Paul, as you work to shape the, the uh, Children's Museum, you're going to not shape a generic Children's Museum. You're going to shape a, a Children's Museum that belongs in El Paso. Talk about your thinking about El Paso, about the connection to the land and the geography here, the special, um, the special status of El Paso as a, a, a border city, um, and, and the identity and how that identity will inform your programs. So the challenge coming into any community, so I, as I said, I'm new in El Paso, is to figure out uh, what are the barriers to access? What, what is stopping uh, children from coming? And so I haven't uh, yet, in the two months I've been here, 
determined what all those are. But, but the, what we know is that often it's not financial. We, that's the, that's the, the, the response we often create. How do we create uh, free access? How do we cr pay for the busing? How do we do all these things to bring schools, to bring families? But it turns out often challenges are uh, related to time and availability of time. You know, if both parents are, if, if you have even a two-parent household, but both parents are working full-time, then weekends are for shopping with the family, et cetera. You're not thinking. Doing chores and doing the, the, the work of the household. Exactly. And so you're not thinking, how do I spend my leisure time if you don't even have leisure, leisure time, time to, to think spend. about? Right. You know, um, I, I come from a museum where I was CEO where we closed at 4 p.m. every day. No parent was home yet with their, with their children by 4 p.m. So if we didn't have at least one day we had extended hours, we were closing off a large part of the community from being able to attend. And so from, from my point of view, as I try to shape this new museum in the community, what we have to determine first is what are the barriers? And as I think I, I said earlier, a lot of that barrier is it's a failure of imagination. Uh, if I've never imagined myself or my family in a museum, I'm not going to suddenly start doing that right. because I've seen an advertisement in the paper or something like that. We need to help people understand what's going to happen. What is your response to those linguistic challenges in order to get particularly families who come in who, where the children might be multilingual but the parents uh, are not? How do you deal with that? Well, El Paso Holocaust Museum is one of 13 freestanding Holocaust museums and we are the only bilingual ho um, Holocaust Museum in the United States and we're very proud of that. But we recognize that we couldn't exist here in our Southwest home if we didn't do that because we would miss an opportunity to truly connect in a place where people are most comfortable. So for us, we're very careful that our, our museum is bilingual and we don't just do a, a, a Google Translate and slap that up there. We want to be sure that it is actually the dialect that people feel the most comfortable learning in. So we're very careful, and we work with uh, Dr. Ford, uh, who's now retired from, from the University of Texas at El Paso, to make sure that our translations are ones where people feel very comfortable interacting in that. Because if the language is a barrier, then it doesn't matter what's on that panel or what's on that video, they're just going to walk away. So that it's it's a it's a challenge here. But every time I see a challenge, all I hear is opportunity. It's just an opportunity for us to connect in a much deeper way with our with our whole audience. And Paul, as you're building this museum, you you actually have to shape it, and you can shape from the ground up. How is that informing your work? Well, so so of course, at the moment, we're only a website, but uh, <laughs> but our but our website is also. Um, as I just I was thinking of exactly the same example. We uh, many science centers and children's museums, uh, including quite close by in Albuquerque, etc., uh, use Google Translate to to provide bilingual websites. We haven't done that. We've started from scratch to make sure that the information we're providing is, is in uh, is in English and Spanish because because that's necessary for our visitors. And but, grammatical English and, and grammatical, grammatical Spanish. Yes, I mean, that's, the, the, yes. the thing is, is that yes. any reader of the language is going to know immediately whether the, whether the commitment is to bilingualism or not. Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just as true. Well, and, and uh, interestingly, we're just starting our Facebook and our social media uh, platforms. And, uh, you know, if we tweet, it will be uh, not everything translated. We're going to tweet sometimes in English and sometimes in Spanish. Because I don't feel in this community that it is necessary to translate everything no. word for word. No, a, you the, can, the you fluidity can, is, is mm -hmm. incredible here. And exactly. I don't even think I don't think it's something that's even even considered. I don't think it's something that and and again, I'm not from here I'm not a native. I've spent most of my life outside the US functioning in other languages. But this has got to be one of the most fluid places I've ever lived. And so much as you people go back and forth, and, the, and it's not only Spanish, but we're speaking of English and Spanish right now because there right. are many other languages that are spoken here, quite common, you know, and they're quite common. Um, but the fluidity is just, it's just natural. You don't even, and I don't even, 
my Spanish is not great, but I don't even notice it as, it's, I mean, there's a mixture that happens and you, people just go back and forth and right. it's, it's just very natural. And there's mixing no, words as well within the same course, sentence and with mm, the same paragraph yeah, yeah. and, and, and it, it, it becomes this, this really energized, mm -hmm. I, I find that, that languages, when they, when, when they meld, it becomes a very energized, mm -hmm. a very textured uh, environment in mm -hmm. which to speak. We take the same approach as the Holocaust Museum. It's, it's important to us that we're bilingual, bilingual we're accessible, um, we uh, professionally translate. It, it's, it's important that we present the information um, in, in as accurate as way as possible. But, you know, I think one thing that struck me about the bilingual aspect of this community is that whether you speak English or Spanish or you're bilingual, people really value language as just a form of communication. And to your point that when it starts to become combined, it just becomes that much more interesting and in some ways accurate. Um, we have bilingual text in the museum and I've heard from English speakers how much they appreciate the Spanish translations because they would rather read it in Spanish and then vice versa. So a lot of times I think museums will translate and, and have bilingual or multi-languages, and they'll think that they're serving specific audiences with that language, but that's not necessarily the case here. Um, there are people who just want the other language just because it um, provides a more enriching experience for them. Thank you so much for sharing your insights, Tracy Jerome, Director of the Museum and Cultural Affairs of the City of El Paso. Uh, thank you, um, Victoria Ramirez, uh, director of the El Paso Museum of Art, uh, Lori Shepard of the El Paso Holocaust Museum, executive director, and Paul Cortinar, uh, founding director of the El Paso Children's Museum. Thank you so much for sharing the work of your marvelous, marvelous institutions, and thank you so much for your insights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.